Hi, I'm Monique Roffey. I'm um, an author. I've um, recently published a novel with People Tree Press. Um, extremely honoured to be in their in their um, in their really salubrious list of of writers. Um, and my novel is called The Mermaid of Black Conch. And I started writing it several years ago, and um, it's a story about a, a woman who was cursed um, by other women to be a mermaid and who has been an exile and outcast, extremely lonely, and denied her, her erotic rite of passage into womanhood um, because she was pretty and beautiful and sang very well. Um, and it's a story about her being caught um, in fairly contemporary modern times by a bunch of fishermen who immediately realise um, that she's worth millions and want to um, sell her. And she's also rescued by a fisherman. And the story really is about the impact she has on the people who try to help her and uh, in some way, she helps them, of course. And it's about her short time um, in this Caribbean island. And it also explores themes of, um, you know, how uh, could we take care of an indigenous woman um, who came back to live with us? Um, how would we care for her? Um, it brings up issues around female jealousy, love, love in the Caribbean, um, betrayal and um, yeah it's a it's a love story it's a double love story actually so without um, much more to do I'm going to attempt to read from it from when uh, in the early pages um, page 22 um, when these uh, white men from America who have come down for a fishing competition um, catch more than they bargained on um, so I'll read from when they first see her on their fishing hook, on their hook, they've hooked her. That thing's about to come up, shouted the father. Son of a goddamn bitch is coming up. Keep your rod up. The flat dark sea broke open and the mermaid rose up and out of the water, her hair flying like a nest of cables and her arms flung backwards in the jump, her body glistening with scales and her tail flailing, huge and muscular, like that of a creature from the deepest part of the ocean. She beat up and out, arcing through the air so that she flipped on her back. The men saw her head, they saw her breasts, they saw her belly, the pubic bone of a woman where it met the tail of a glistening fish. Jesus Christ, exclaimed Thomas Clayson. Nicer crossed himself. The black conch men gasped. Cut the line, shouted Nicer Country. Cut the goddamn line. All f five men were horrified as she hit the water thrashing. Her mouth was bloody and she'd only just started to fight. On the end of Hank Clayson's rod was a wild creature, furious to be so caught. Nicer knew they'd hook something they shouldn't have. He jumped down from the flight bridge with his knife. The mermaid, or whatever it was, deserved to stay in the sea. This wasn't his business at all. The thing looked far too big for the boat. It could even take the boat down. Don't do that, shouted Thomas Clayson, as Nysa bent to cut the line. Do not do that! She's worth millions! Millions! We're bringing her in, God damn it! We are bringing her in. She was on the surface now, thrashing like a mako shark fighting the line with her arms, coughing up blood, and spitting and screaming a wailing song. Oh, God! stammered Frank, Hank. Did you see that? His hands were shaking on the rod. The father wanted to take it from him. The black conch men, Nicholas and Shortleg, backed away from the stone. Like Nicer, they knew this was wrong. They afraid bad jumpy get catch. They didn't want to help. They were lost for words and for what to do. The white men wanted to pull this creature from the sea. But this fish was half woman, plain enough. Everyone had heard of the mermen of black conch waters. But a mer woman? Nah. 
She carried with her bad luck at best, and her hair had frightened them, like they could kill from just one lash of those tentacles. She could poison them all. They'd seen spikes on her back, dorsal spikes, scorpion fish spikes. They had seen a bloody, raging woman on the end of a fishing line. And now these white men wanted to bring her in? Now, nah, boy, they all said to themselves. The mermaid was now under the surface again. The younger Clayson's face was full of terror and excitement. Hold her, shouted the father. What does it look like I'm doing? The son snapped. Keep backing up on it, Thomas Clayson shouted to Nysa. Nysa had begun to see dollar signs. It had been, if it had been him alone, he would have thrown her back in the sea. But the talk made him realise this could make him enough money for another boat, a new car, even a small business of his own. Imagine that. He threw the throttle into reverse and slowed the boat down. The engine hummed. Nysa could feel his own curiosity grow. How much could she fetch? He backed the boat slowly onto the fish. The line had stopped going out. The younger Clayson was lifting and lowering his rod, lifting and lowering, and the line was now coming back onto the reel as fast as he could turn the reel handle. The mermaid had gone back under for now. That thing must weigh like, what, 600 pounds, said Thomas Clayson. The ocean was flat and empty again. There was silence apart from the sound of the reel ticking over. Did you see her? said Hank Clayson. Hell yes, said the father. Did you see her tits? said the son. He was so entranced by what he caught, it had loosened his tongue. Hell yes. Did you see her face? Yes. Did you see her arms? Yes. Did you see her pussy bone? All the men nodded at this. We could sell her to the Smithsonian, said Thomas Clayson, or the Rockefeller Institute for research. The line was coming slowly in, and for the next 20 minutes, the men stared hard astern each calculating what might happen if they caught her, and each feeling a deep, boiling-up sensation in his groin. They didn't know what to expect. They kept their eyes on the sea and listened to the reel ticking in. She was coming in, but she would fight again. Be careful we don't end up over her, said Thomas. Nyssa knew that could happen. He revved the engine again. Tighten on her just a little, said the father. Hank Clayson had been holding the rod and the weight of the mermaid for almost two hours. His whole body was aflame with the strain of it. The line started to go out again. Let the motor idle. Nysa stopped the engine, and then the boat started to move backwards. Hank Clayson was reeling her in, but the shorter the line got, the more she pulled back. There was a creaking sound somewhere in the boat's hull. She was pulling back on the line. She must weigh the same as another boat. Nysa, th if she got under the hull... She could take Dauntless down. Minutes ticked past. The ocean was quiet again, metallic blue. Take only what you need, she whispered. Shit, said Thomas Clayton. She's under the boat. Okay. So, um, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, feel free to read a copy. It's been long listed for the not, not the long, it's been long listed for a very long um, not the Booker Prize. Um, you might want to vote for it. You might want to buy it and vote for it. Anyway, enjoy. Thanks for listening. It's Monique Roffey. Bye-bye.